get out to the departure end of the runway, then a left turn and a lowest downwind. Cessna over the threshold, coming up on the white dot, Adderby on the white dot, left turn first available. I got a high wind coming up on about a half mile final, clear to land Adderby on. Traffic on the left face, you're following a Cessna down, low off your left. Square it up just a little bit, and then we're going to get you in. Start your descent, though. Start your descent on the base. Traffic on final, give me follow on base. Base traffic, start turning toward the numbers now. High wing coming up on quarter mile final, take it all the way down to the green. Cessna taxiing on the green, expedite down to the next hard surface. Get me some speed, there you go, 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 go fast. This is going to be good. I got traffic on a mile final. You're following traffic ahead and to your right. High wing coming up on the threshold. Take it all the way down to the green dot. Bob Charlie Sarah, two mile final. A mile final. Turn north. Turn north, and we're going to just make you. Uh, we're going to bring you back around. Jet traffic's coming up on about a mile and a half final runway. Nine are clear to land. Okay. All right. Let's 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 listen up, guys. If you're on final for runway nine, I want you to offset to the left. I got a jet that's landing on runway nine. The jet's cleared to land runway nine. If you can make it. If not. Just continue straight ahead. It looks like you're going around for the jet. That's fine. That's fine. That's fine. Oh, we had one right in front of us, sir. Dragger. Let's see. What we got? A tricycle. Tricycle. Put it down. Tricycle. Put it down. Tricycle. Put it down. Tail dragger. Down to the green. Uh, green dot. Then a left turn. Short final here. You click land on nine. All the way to the white dot. Go down to the white dot. Find somebody to follow out here. Canard, just come to the runway, and I might have to just send you around. That'll be fine. And for the jet, you just want to stay in this pattern, or you want to go back out for an instrument approach? Stay in a pattern. Charlie here. All right, just stay with me here for a minute. And my tail dragger, and eh, let's see, over the numbers, go down to the green. Come on. And Canard's going to have to go around. Canard, go around. Canard, go around. Canard, go around. And my uh, high wing here over the runway, keep it airborne. Keep it airborne. You do not descend. Do not descend. you got a fast guy behind you. Do not descend. My head. There you go. Keep it airborne. Keep it airborne. As soon as the guy behind you gets uh, slowed down, I'm going to put you down. So keep it airborne. The uh, one that just passed the white dot, make a left turn on the hard surface. All right, my uh, high wing tail dragger, you can put it down now. You can put it down now. And Charlie Sierra, let me get you about a mile off. Let's see, Charlie Sierra, I lost. There you are. Make a left hand turn. I'll try to resequence you here on the down ones. We'll see how it looks. Short final, you're clear to land runway nine on the white dot. Clear to land on the white dot. There you go. And the tricycle left on the hard surface and follow the flagman. Welcome. Uh, thanks for being part of the show. And let's see, just find somebody to follow out those, uh, follow on the final, and as you get close to the runway, if it's not going to work, we're going to send you around and then try to resequence you. Now, who else got sent around that's not back on the downwind? The Canard? Yeah, Canard. All right, Canard, there's a golf stream up there that went around, too. I just lost sight of him, but you're going to make kind of a left-hand turn and stay low. I think Charlie's here went for your altitude. 3,200. Okay, that'll be fine. Just maintain VFR. I don't know what else is up there above you. Probably most everybody's down here. So just make a left-hand turn. We'll try to get uh, try to get you back here. Canard got the uh, jet inside. Okay, the RV, maybe an RV-10, whatever. You're on final. Keep your speed up and go all the way down to the... Uh, aim for the green dot for me. Uh, actually, keep your speed up. There's a guy behind you. Aim for the green dot. I'm sure that's plenty of room for you to land on runway 9. You're going to land on runway 9. Number two... You're going to go down to the white dot. Follow the white dot. Actually, you know what? That's 1,500 feet. You're going to land at the white dot. The uh, spacing looks adequate here. Two guys on final. You're kind of tight there. Keep each other in sight, and you're going to uh, aim for the white dot. If it's not going to work, we'll do. Uh, we'll come up with a plan B. We might have to send you around. The second guy behind the, you out there in about a two-mile final. Are you slow enough to be able to follow that guy in front of you? You need to go around. Well, I probably shouldn't ask that because I had about five guys to answer me, so I should know better than that. After 35 years, you would think, right? All right, so uh, let me see. The guy who's number one, it's number one. What kind of airplane is he? RV. An RV type. All right, RV type. Keep it airborne for me. Keep it airborne. And I got a fast guy behind you. The number two guy over the uh, uh, trees there. Go ahead and put it down on the numbers. Put it down on the numbers. My first guy just coming up on the numbers at the, uh, over the grass at the numbers. I want you to keep T minus one minute and counting. Hello. Three, two, one. 
Hello, 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 everybody, and welcome to this Thursday afternoon's live stream. We have got an amazing show for you tonight. I can see down at the bottom of my screen the super famous, world famous Fred North is sitting there just waiting to come on and talk and looking at the comments. Uh, that's basically one of the best things that everyone's come along for. So before we go on and get through the news and, and basically get everything done so we can get to Fred, I have to thank Sky Demon for supporting this. Thank you very, very much, Sky Demon. Hugely appreciated. Really, really valuable. And I have to say, whoops, where's my Sky Demon busy? There it is. Here's this week's Sky Demon tip from the top people. It's Sky Demon. Hi, I'm Tim from Sky Demon. Welcome to today's top tip. When you're flying, use the direction indicator at the bottom of the screen to see your current track and the track you need to fly in order to make your next waypoint. If you like, you can drag out the DI to turn it into a full on HSI which you can change the size of using a pinch gesture. To put it back, just drag it to the bottom of the screen. Alternatively, you can tap it once, and this changes it to a course correction indicator, which is very small and simply tells you if you need to turn right or left by a certain amount of degrees. Press it again to turn it back into a DI. For more information on any of our features, go to skydemon.aero and choose help and support. Great tip from Sky Demon there. Slightly strange thing going on with your synchronization at the end of it. At least it was on my screen. Ah, That's so yeah, it's all right. It's one of those things with Sky Demon, mm. isn't it? There's there's things like that you either know or you accidentally find one day where you 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 click and drag by mistake and you go, "What's happened there? Well, what's this?" <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it kind of that's the bit that turns into a pseudo ILS as well. I think. So we'll yeah. to, maybe we'll get the pseudo ILS tip up as well. So uh, yeah, thank you again, Sky Demon. Um, moving on, young Simon with his colourful shirts not with us today, but uh, let's give you. Have I, have I forgotten something? No, I haven't forgotten okay. anything. Good. Haven't got the. <laughs> Simon, here's this weekend's weather from Simon. Let's see how beautiful it is going to be in the UK this weekend. Hi, everyone. I hope that you're having a good evening. Sorry I can't be with you this evening. Look, I haven't even had time to change into a, a bright shirt. i uh, been at a conference all day today, uh, so, yeah, my apologies for that. Um, now, it looks like we are going to get some decent flying weather going into the weekend, but um, just want to make you aware of lowering freezing levels, or at least lower freezing levels, than we've been used to. So this is the forecast freezing level for Friday. It doesn't actually change that much uh, through the weekend. And typical values you see here of sort of 1,200 to 1,000 metres uh, overall. So what are we looking at there? 3,000 to perhaps 3,600, 3,800 feet. So certainly lower values of freezing than we've been experiencing so far in what seems to have been, doesn't it, September that's lasted for three months. But November well and truly here now. This is the forecast for tomorrow. We've got low pressure centred across southern parts of Scotland, bringing rain across much of Scotland tomorrow. Some showers for northwest England, western Wales, southwestern parts of England. Relatively few showers, though, across the Midlands, East Anglia and southern England, as well as the far north of Scotland. And I think actually what happens is conditions do tend to improve during the course of the day. Typical bases by the afternoon, about 3,000 feet across um, England and Wales. Tops initially about 15,000 feet, but then actually lower into around 10 to 12,000 feet later on. In the rain, we're looking at bases of just three to perhaps 500 feet and the top's about 15,000 feet. So basically, yeah, forget it. Um, headed in towards Saturday, much better day. Maybe some morning mist and fog patches at first, particularly across central and western Scotland, western parts of England and Wales. The day will clear and then most of the day actually looks as if it is going to be a fair day. I think for most of us, we should find some decent VFR conditions. Base is 4,000 feet, tops at about 8,000 feet. But some rain down these eastern coasts, courtesy of the occluded front that you see there. Base is here about 1,000 feet, tops at about 10,000 feet. Late on in the day, this system comes in from the west, bringing wind and rain through Ireland. And that's going to be affecting us during the course of Sunday. And then on Sunday, that low is in the North Sea. Fronts having passed eastwards, taking the outbreaks of rain with them. Most of the rain across Scotland and northwest England. Here, base is 1,000 feet, tops at about 15,000 feet. So, Thoroughly unpleasant. Western parts of Wales, southwest England, heavy showers being driven in on that wind. Bases of around 2,000 feet, tops at about 20,000 feet. 
with some cunium in there. But inland, yes, it's breezy, but we find bases 3,000 feet, tops at 15,000 feet, just with one or two showers around. Now, I'm delighted to announce my next evening aviation weather school course. This is going to be held on the consecutive Tuesday evenings of the 31st of January and the 7th of February 2023 between 6.30pm and 9pm on those consecutive Tuesdays. Um, I'll show you how you can predict weather windows up to five days in advance, build your weather confidence as well, and just take you beyond the PPL uh, Met exam so that you really get under the skin of weather. You can book your place now at weatherschool.co.uk and what an ideal Christmas gift. And I should say above all, the course is great fun. You will learn so much. Okay, I will leave you with that for now. Uh, whatever you're doing, have a fantastic weekend and I'll see you guys and girls uh, next week. Bye for now. Okay. Thank you very much, Simon. Yeah. Does it does like a good weekend forecast for flying. Yeah. At least, at least that, kind of, that kind of really keys me off, really, because it's like two great days of flying, and I'm nowhere near the country. It's like, oh, oh, man. Yeah, I'm just just doing something here. Dave White says those are some really nice hats behind Ed. Will he put one on for us? Of course, Dave. I'm very happy to wear one. <laughs> <laughs> You'd have very muddy hair if they were my spats. Yeah, I just realised no, they haven't been washed out yet. So <laughs> that was a mistake. <laughs> um, is it time? I, I, I wonder whether it's time. Talking about your hair, Ed, I wonder whether it's time to release this onto the great world. This was this was earlier during COVID, people. I haven't got time to worry about my hair. I just want to feel good about the way I look. New L'Oreal LV New Vitamin Shampoo for men. Just just when you think that. Just when you think that video has died, and it, it, it no, comes back. We've all got a copy. <laughs> that, <laughs> that will yeah. probably get us a copyright strike, but it was worth it, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. uh, yes. Right. Hey, then, hey, news. Uh, hey, so, promotion. Yeah, I've got the first item. Uh, the new Hang promotion. On, oh. oh, yes. Hey, hey, oh. Hey. Hey. Put it back. Club promotion. Sarah, what should people do in November? They should become members of the Flyer Club. It's the only club worth being part of uh, for exclusive content, up-to-date news and aviation. It's the only place to be. And you get free landing vouchers every month. So it really is a winner. So become a member in November, please. Access to every single thing we do for five quid a month. It can't be bad, really, can it? So if you want us to carry on doing what we're doing, pay five quid a month and join us. That'd be fantastic. If you don't, then don't. And we'll, we'll, I don't know. We'll do something else. Um, okay. The weather, not the weather. We've had no, the weather. We've had the the weather. news. Now we can do the news. Yes. On, so man. take it away, Ed. Yeah, the new compilation of Flyer for December has been released. Uh, this is uh, obviously Flyer Club members can download this, um, and it uh, goes along with the all the features that you've been able to access on the web, just in an easily downloadable format. Uh, in it, you'll find the flight test of the Technam's newest fully certified trainer, the P Mentor. Um, there's the great where's that smoke coming from feature Adrian Beanie you remember appeared on last week's live stream um, to talk about his partial engine failure and force landing uh, plus there's a piece about uh, getting your night rating and a Robin adventure to France uh, for a fly-in at the Robin factory um, so head to the website download it for offline reading fun so I hadn't, hadn't realised Adrian Beanie looked quite so like Catherine Maloney <laughs> <laughs> right, Sarah, some sad news. Yeah, we've got sad news this week uh, of the passing of Frank Robinson. Sorry, for anyone who doesn't know, Frank Robinson founded Robinson Helicopter Company in 1973, uh, shortly after he created the Robinson R22, the two-seater piston-powered helicopter. He later introduced the R44, the four-seater, and then he created Robinson's first turbine helicopter, which was the R66, and that was just in 2010. Um, to give you an idea of how successful the company's been, uh, to date, there has been more than 13,000 Robinson helicopters delivered worldwide. So, sad news, um, but his legacy lives on. So. A, real, a real game changer. Mm. A real yeah, game -changer. absolutely. I, I remember... I happened to be at the factory once, a long, long, long time ago, and uh, Frank, Frank was around. There was a new buyer 
who'd sort of come along. And I remember he, he kind of came, the new buyer came back looking a bit bemused. He'd kind of specified his R44 at the time with, you know, I want, I want this bit of kit, I want that bit of kit, I want this bit of kit. I want. And Frank had pulled him to one side and said, why have you ordered all that stuff? It just makes it heavier. Just get rid of it. Don't buy that stuff. Just go for light and simple. You'll be much better off. And uh, the guy cancelled all that part of his order and just took his. Head. So yeah, Frank was a big one for for light and simple. Hmm. Yeah, but, yeah. 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 Happy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely, Johnny. Cornwall. Yeah. So uh, news from Cornwall today. So the uh, or rather yesterday, the UK's first orbital space launch is now one step closer because Spaceport Cornwall has officially received its spaceport license from the CAA. Um, so there's a big hoo-ha from uh, Transport Secretary Mark Harper, Richard Moriarty of the CAA, um, all congratulating the airport on this. So it basically means that the airport and the operators are licensed to operate spacecraft and carrier aircraft, that's in as in spacecraft carrying aircraft, from Newquay. Um, the CAA has been space regulator since July 2021. Um, and this was actually kept, this came on the day of the Artemis launch, which was the other of, of the two great live streams this week. This being one of them. The other one was the NASA Artemis launch. Um, so, yeah, we, we should, I think, next year see the first um, drop from Virgin Orbit with their 747 um, from Nuki, which would be interesting. I'm sure that's going to come with loads of restricted areas and temporary danger areas and layers and layers of. Stuff that we can't fly through, but it's at least something good for the UK aerospace industry. Yes. We can, in, in, as we can't fly, we can all watch the congratulatory back slapping going on between the CA and everyone else who've given them permission to do it. Just, and politicians and stuff like that. Um, talking of CA, next story up is Barnsley. Barnsley Airspace Reviews, kind of like largely over the Barnsley altimeter setting region. Um, and it's coming up and they've asked for your input. But the most important thing, well, maybe not most, yeah, actually probably the most important thing as far as we're concerned is the Manchester low level route. They've asked for our input on the Manchester low level route. So have a look and see if you can come up with a way where it could be more complicated than it actually is. Um, but no, 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 see if you could simplify it. Just make it class G. That would be like an easy win, wouldn't it? Just make it class G and get on with it. Um, so uh, go online. I think there's a link in the heading which someone may put up later but otherwise google that um and have a go it's kind of taken after the cotswold review which was probably a little bit underwhelming for most people so hopefully the barnsley one won't be it will encompass doncaster and there's some interesting stuff going on at doncaster i'm not sure what at the moment other than the fact that we all thought it was going to go away on the 18th but apparently it's not and there's some people the the, the consultation with the staff over their redundancy and changes maybe been halted so there's kind of this maybe there's a chance that someone's actually going to buy it and keep it as an airport who knows mm. um, so yeah so some strange stuff going on there sarah over to you yeah we've got some good news this time around uh this is from the air league so um i was lucky enough to meet a couple of representatives from from the air league actually at the pilot careers event recently um, so for anyone who doesn't know what their aim is, it's to inspire young people from all backgrounds into the aviation and aerospace industries. Um, they try to increase the accessibility of a career in aviation to people from disadvantaged backgrounds and they try and break down the perceived barriers to the aviation industry. Um, and by the sounds of the data that they've just revealed, they are succeeding because... In 2022, over £180,000 was awarded to individuals across the UK in the form of scholarships. And two in five of these scholars were from an ethnic or minority background. 80% of scholars' parents were not university educated. And nearly 40% of scholars in 2022 were female, which is well above industry average. So they're clearly making a really positive impact in supporting young people in future career pathways. And yeah, it's fantastic news, really. That's pretty good. Yep. Yeah. Well done, well done Air League. Well Johnny? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, sad news depending on, um, well, yeah, sad news, really, because the final howl will take place from Vulcan XH558. Uh, very soon um, on the twentieth. Um, so basically, the obviously the airport's closing. The they they tried to work with 
you know, the relevant authorities, CAA and other people, to get the airplane flown out, but that was just deemed too expensive. Um, so they're going to have one final engine run, um, and then that will be it for um, Vulcan XH 558, which will be a shame. It last flew in October 2015, so it's been doing taxiing for quite a while. It's, it's one of three currently that taxi. Yeah. Um, one at South End, and the other, the other one that's trying to find a new career at um, Wellsbourne as a as a piece of farm machinery. <laughs> they've, they've recovered it now. Um, it. But if you, I think if you do, if you do want to hear that how one last time, then you can go on the twentieth. I'm not sure, quite sure what the official arrangements are because I imagine the road yeah. network nearby is going to be carnage. But um, yeah, that will be the end of XH558. And it is it is crazy because you know the airplane. But there's a lot of debate about whether it ended up in the right place and mm. you know all that's gone on with the airplane. It's just a shame it hasn't and it hasn't gone somewhere where it, yeah could have been loved. So. Yeah, absolutely. Yep, indeed. Ed, I believe you got a quick update for us. I have got a quick on update. The Christmas um, competition. Uh, well, yes. So, uh, obviously, last week, uh, Dave gave you news that um, uh, Spitfires were going back into production um, in the UK. Uh, it was a cheeky headline from Airfix, uh, but it was all about the fact they're putting a, a big, their new big uh, 124th scale model back into production. Um, but we were chatting about this on Livestream Extra, and um, we decided it would be fun to challenge each other to have a kit off where we all build Airfix Spitfires. Now, Airfix themselves got uh, involved in this, and they've said they're going to send us four kits uh, so that we can have a kit off at some time, probably in the run-up to Christmas. Um, so watch out for a um, for the Flyer Livestream um, members build Airfix kits competitively, and um, maybe you, the audience, can judge. So yeah, we 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 can keep our kit on though, can't we? Yeah, it's not that kind of kit off, is it? We're keeping our kids off. We are just building. It's like the Bake Off. But, you know, people do get the wrong idea when I keep saying kids off, which is bad. Yeah. yeah. It is. Brilliant. Okay. In that case, I think it's time. We've kind of rattled through the news a little bit quicker than we normally would have, which is good because that means we can bring Fred North in early. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set this. Oh, look at that. That was slick, wasn't it? Sarah, give us a quick introduction, and uh, while you're doing that, I'll bring Fred in down there, and when you're finished, I'll swap him over with you. Sure thing. So I think we've rattled through the news because we're all really excited. We just want to get him on. So, um, yeah, we welcome to the Flyer live stream the biggest Hollywood star you have never seen, because you don't see him. He's behind the camera in a helicopter. Um, so, I mean, if we could just cue the video so people have an idea of um, who Fred North is, if, if they've been living under a... My name is Fred North. I'm a stunt film helicopter pilot. I've been flying for about 35 years. Yay, so welcome everyone. Fred North. Hi. Hello, thank well, you so hi. much for joining us. Yeah, so happy to be here. Thank you, especially oh. there was a lot of planes in your presentation, so I'm happy to have a little bit of a helicopter. <laughs> That's why I'm <laughs> A bit helicoptery, so I'm glad we're team helicopter. You and I. <laughs> we need a, a nice helicopter on Flyers magazine, you know. First, it's basically. okay. We 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 cater to minority interests. Okay, I see that. <laughs> <laughs> so, Fred, I've got to start from the beginning. Um, I want to go back to your first experience in a helicopter. So, I watched an interview once, and am I right in thinking that you were? Eight years old, uh, it was when you grew up in Senegal and that was your first experience in a helicopter. Could you mind telling the viewers what it was like? Yeah, um, yeah, so, you know, you can envision a little uh, a little guy, eight years old, with like a simple T-shirt and like a, you know, like a really nothing on me, not much on me, you know, just playing with my friends and we're in the street and suddenly I hear, you know, um, a loud noise and you have to understand in Africa back then there's no helicopters, no planes. Um, there was not much going on for aviation. So uh, we're just playing and then I hear that noise, loud noise. And then we see that like 
machine you know it's it's like if you were seeing today i guess like a alien ship or something it was a shock for us is like, what is that and the noise because the the machine was an alouette too which is a old french helicopter very noisy like it's very noisy and then he just landed you know maybe uh, uh 300 yards from us in a stadium but back then, you know, I mean, in Africa, there was it, it, in Senegal, it was a, a drought. It was very dry season. No grass on that stadium, just sand. So when we arrived with all my buddies, that you have to envision maybe 300 kids running from everywhere, approaching that stadium, and then we see a gigantic cloud of sand. I mean, just remember the whole scene was insane. The the noise, the the vibration, the sound, the machine disappeared in that cloud. You know, the dust. So anyway, it was like a, emotionally like a shock for us. And then after they landed, um, my uh, social study teacher stepped out with a lot of cameras. And then that's, you know, so he saw me and then he said, you know, we're going to take some photographs. Do you want to come with me? I'm eight years old. You have to understand today, nobody will ever ask at eight years old. But back then, nobody gave a shit about it. And <laughs> basically... Um, I, and he asked if two of my friends wanted to come with me. It's, there's only three three seats in the back. And there was no doors and no seat belts, by the way. And and I'm eight years old and my kids, my friends saying, so then he said, you know, uh, do you want to come in? I said, sure. My friends, they're too scared. They don't want to go. So I'm by myself. Then he putting me in the back. So I'm sitting in the middle, but there's only three seats. There's no doors, no seat belts, nothing. I'm eight years old. I go on the helicopter. We take off, and then he, he's doing a little turn. I think I'm going to fall. I'm holding to the back of the seat. It's crazy experience. So everything, anyway, we go there. We fly the wind, the noise, the sand. I mean, it just basically destroyed my mind forever. So when I came back and I landed, I ran like crazy to my mom, and I told her I'm going to be a helicopter pilot one day. That was it. That was the moment. Crazy. Yeah. That is amazing. I mean, you know, that free, this is Africa. Anything can happen. You know, these things would never happen now. I just think it's absolutely no. amazing. Um, yeah. You make it sound. It's so um, sort of theatrical. I can sort of envision, envisage how it was as such a small child. It must have been absolutely incredible. It was. So, that was it. It was decided then you were going to be a helicopter pilot. So after you did your commercial um, pilot's license, what was your sort of first job as a helicopter pilot? Well, I mean, first of all, I, I didn't know. I mean, my parents were teachers, so I was not in aviation world at all. Oh, that's oh, oh, I thought that was me, but... Oh, what's happened there? Let's... I don't know. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Little, little glitch. Um, I, I had no experience of aviation, so just for me to be a helicopter pilot was a, a complicated uh, setup. And I think even today, uh, you know, I'm getting a lot of um, questions on how to become a helicopter pilot. There's no uh, guidelines for it. You know, you can find a school, but which school? So anyway, it was a little bit complicated for me. Um, I found a, a school in in Paris. And I just went there, and I remember the first day I, I went there, and then I told the, the company there, the guy, I said, you know, I just want to be a helicopter pilot, like if, if it was something impressive to him, you know. And yeah. I, I remember the guy said, well, you know, we don't have a school here. And it was just charter and stuff. And then I told him, I said, but uh, why you don't buy a, you know, a helicopter so I can do my training? Long story short, that's what they did. That was the first student for those guys. And then the, the instructor, I was also the first student for him, you know. Wow. So, so you have to understand there was a few scary moments in my training. And one of them was when I did my first solo um, at only six hours total time. So the guy oh. let me do a solo flight after six hours. And I was so, like, scared that when you do your solo the the instructor step out of the helicopter is in that field and he's you know he has a radio and then you do your little loop around i basically aim for him instead to go to the square 
I was so scared. I, he was my comfort zone. So I basically yeah. aimed. He had to jump away for me to not basically land on him. So there was a few yeah. moments like that, you know. You just went full Vietnam at him. And the percent. I did my solo what, after six hours, you know. <laughs> I mean, that's incredible. What helicopter did you train in then? It was an ends from a Shark, a 280, mm -hmm. which is not a, a very easy machine to learn, by the way. Yeah, I'm sure you found that out very quickly. Yeah. Absolutely. That's amazing. So your, it was your first, uh, he was your first, you know, sorry, you were his first student. And um, I can imagine, yeah, that was very tricky for both of you. But um, and how many hours did you complete your training in? So what happened is, so I wanted to do my commercial. I didn't have the money to do uh, a private, you know, for fun. So um, first of all, in fact, before I started my training, I had to find the money. So I, had to, I bought some cars, fix them, sell them. I, it, it took me a little while to get the money just to start. So it was a big deal to me, you know. So then we started to do the training. After that little event of the solo flight, um, it kind of, I lost a little bit of confidence because it was such a scary moment. I was not ready. I should not have done my solo after six hours. Even if I was kind of, I understood the way it works. Mentally, I was not solid enough. So I think, it sh you know, we should have waited a little bit more. So because I lost confidence, it took me another 20 hours to do my second solo. So I kept, you know, doing all my training like that. And then, and then I did my, um, my, uh, my private license, but it was like a, a, a stream, you know, process directly to the commercial. It was for a year and a half I did a, a, my commercial license. That's still fairly quick, though. It's true what you say, though, about losing confidence. Sometimes that you can lose it so quickly, and it's such a shame because it takes such a while to build it back up again, doesn't it? And it seems not but, worth it at the time. No, especially, I think, when you, when you learn, and I think it's for whatever you learn, but for aviation, it's tricky because the machine is big and there's liability and everything. I think when you start, you don't understand the liability concept, uh, mm -hmm. but there is you and the machine and the machine is more controlling you at the beginning so you're only trying to massage that machine i think when you get really um, more experience and to me i only realized it when i was four or five thousand hours that's when the machine didn't exist anymore but when you do the training the machine is so present and it's controlling your mindset it's controlling your ability so to me i only understood all that stuff later and i just regret that regretted that I didn't know that before, because if I would have understand that relationship between the pilot student and the machine, I think I could have progressed a little bit faster. That's really interesting. I mean, they say, you know, hindsight is a beautiful thing, isn't it? And only sometimes you learn these things afterwards, but it's very interesting. So when you got your commercial license, was your first job sort of like private chartered? Is that what you went into before the filming or? I did tours. So I, <laughs> I flew a Bell 47. And I was doing sightseeing. That's what I did the first year. And where was that? In France? In France, yeah. So basically the whole coastline of uh, west of France, you know, um, Brittany to all the way down. Uh, I was, the, the, the helicopter, you know, was on the truck and we had to move it from one village to another. And then every weekend we were, I was selling tickets. I was uh, taking the money from people who we were doing everything. So that first year, I flew 970 hours on a Bell 47 doing tours. So you were one man band, just doing it all. There was another person with me. So there were two people um, back then, no engineer, uh, just greasing ourselves. But I was yeah. a little bit sketchy, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds a little bit, a bit like an eight year old uh, flying in a helicopter with no seatbelt, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and no doors. <laughs> and no doors, yeah, just a minor point yeah. there. Um, yeah. So then how did you progress from that into aerial filming? How did that come about? So after the, after the tours, I decided to, I wanted to, you know, go to bigger machine with an A-Star, you know, um, mm -hmm. and um, Airbus, you know, helicopter. Back then it was aerospatial, but it's the same thing. So... Uh, so I went back to the company that uh, did my training originally in Paris. I went back to that guy because that guy told me, Fred, you know, uh, if you do your license and then you have 1,000 hours, come back to me and I will give you a job. He said that. 
So I came back to him. I had 1,100 and something, 1,150 hours. And I said, you know, um, I, I knock at his door and say, hey, I'm ready. Hire me. And then he said, well, I told you that, but you need to have experience on the A-star, which I did not have. I said, but that you didn't say that. And I said, you know, so he was maybe 45, 50 years old, and I was like 21 or something. And I said, so you're going to tell me that you basically miss, you know, lead me. So I was, you know, all my effort was with you telling me that. And then you're going to, it was, a, it's going to be a big disappointment. You just, you can't do that. So then yeah. he said, oh, you're fucking pain in the ass, you know. Um, he said, okay, we'll see what we can do. So what he did, back then in France, I don't know if you, you're too young to remember, but there's a couple of guys that have more experience here. I don't know if you remember, there was a shuttle, helicopter shuttle between Paris and the airports, Orly and Charles de Gaulle, back then. And they were doing that. So he wanted to basically make sure I was motivated enough to get a job as a young pilot. So he put me at the counter in, at the airport to give directions to the passengers, no flying, nothing. So when he told me, he said, you do that for three months. And then if you do all things good, I'll give you a job in three months. I said, okay, but can I fly every day six minutes from Orly, Charlego, Orly Airport to the heliport in Paris, six minutes. Can I do that every day? He said, yes. So every day I was dual control on a Dolphin helicopter, six minutes for free for three months. And that's what my, my, that was my turbine experience. And then after three months, they gave me my job and it was Heli France, uh, the heliport in Paris. And I started to do charters and everything you can, you know, think of with the A stars back then. And then rapidly, so that company was doing the Paris Dakar coverage, the rally. And, and slowly by slowly, you know, uh, I basically went into to do that. So it was kind of a process. Amazing. Right. I don't quite know where oh, Sarah's disappeared to. Here she comes. She's back again. What happened, guys? <laughs> I don't know. Oh, what did you do out there? Sorry. Okay. Fred, yeah. do you remember where you were? <laughs> yes. So, exactly. So, after, you know, so I, like uh, for uh, two years after, you know, with the A Star, I was getting more comfortable with that machine. And that machine really talked to me. All the other helicopters, the Bell 47, amazing machine, the Enstrom complex machine, but there were no feeling between the machine and myself. With the A star, I don't know how to explain that, but I felt home. Immediately the machine was one. I was connecting with the aircraft. Uh, I you know I can read the vibration. I can it was it was slowly coming to me, you know. So I really wanted to become an expert in it. And that's another thing by the way that I didn't get um, as an information. And I think even today students don't get it. I Firstly, believe that if you want to be, you know, um, one of the, the best pilots you can be, I believe you should be an expert in one machine only. I mean, that's my opinion on it. And back then, I, I, I thought, you know, if you can show the license to people and then you show all your type rating, like 10, you were an amazing pilot because you have 10 type rating. And today, if a pilot come to me and he show me, let's say he's 40 years old and he has 5,000 hours, and he showed me his license with one type rating, um, I'm going to say this guy, he knows what he's doing. Versus, so anyway, back then I was trying to fly so many different machines, but I rapidly understood that I should focus on the A-Star. So I was trying to do everything on that machine. And then slowly by slowly, I did a little bit of, of, of filming work for that company, but it's not professional filming work, you know, it just filming a sailboat or filming uh, at, you know, 500 feet or there is no stunt involved. But I did the Paris Dakar and slowly by slowly, I was filming the car maybe, you know, 20 feet from them, 50 feet from them. So slowly by slowly, I was getting there. So after doing a few years of filming those uh, sport events, I really understood there was an expertise to be made as far as filming. And but I didn't know there were a job that existing as a film pilot for movie. I didn't know that there was a position that existed. Mm. So the, 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 so I, I started to do that. And then one day there's a, there's a, an American guy. Um, his name is Larry Blanford and he filmed uh, the first Top Gun as a cameraman. 
and he was doing a movie in Venezuela. And for a reason, there was an H star there, but it was under French registration. They just sold it to somebody over there. So only a French pilot could fly that machine because you need to have the license that goes with the registration. So I don't know how he found my name, but basically called me and he said, we're doing a movie. Do you want to come to Venezuela to do the movie? To me, I didn't understand how that worked because uh, there's a helicopter. For me, if you hire a helicopter, the pilot comes with it at, at the time. He said, no, 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 you know, um, we're going to pay you separately. I said, you're going to pay me from France to go to Venezuela to film the movie? He said, yes, uh, this is crazy. And then he said, yeah, that's what we do in America. I said, you guys, really? And he said, yeah. So long story short, I went to Venezuela. I flew for three weeks. And that's when I understood that was a job as a film pilot. That was a, a possibility. And the things that that guy explained to me, he said, if you film for, um, if you fly and film for a movie, you basically, the way you're shooting the scene, you create an emotion, you tell a story, that's what the movie is about. If you shoot a sport event, like a Formula One race, it's not the way you shoot it. It's what you film. Yeah. When in the movie business, it's not what you film. It's the way you do it. So when he told me that, then everything was, you know, so appealing to me because there is way more as a pilot, if you can create, you know, by the way you fly, the, the shot, the emotion, the story, there is, it's way more rewarding you know, instead to just, you know, moving controls to do something for somebody else. So basically there was a light switch on after that. So when I came back from Venezuela, I decided to dedicate all my effort um, to try to be a film pilot. That's amazing. Actually, one of the questions I was going to ask you is how much freedom are you given when, when you're told to try and get a shot? You know, how much of like your creativity can you bring to it? In, I mean, right now, a lot, but it's a process. Uh, yeah. You know, right now, uh, the director would just send me the script and let's say he would say there's a helicopter attacking uh, a train, let's say, you know. And in his mind, you know, he will go for basic cliche because they don't know. He's going to say, okay, the, the helicopter will come over the train and maybe you can uh, repelling a few bad guys on the train and then they can attack the people inside the train. So now what I would do, and that I did that for a movie called Extraction 2 that is going to come out uh, in, a, uh, I think, April or May. And when he told me that, I suggested to the director why we don't land the helicopter on the moving train and we land one skid on the train and then five guys get out and attack, you know, the train instead to do what we've seen a billion times, repelling. So then they, they, now they built the whole sequence on uh, doing this so we did it and we so i have a lot of, of freedom as far as creativity and even more and more and more um but it was a process because the director and the studio need to make sure that what you're offering is can be safely done and also you know it's not going to be too complicated to do so i have to if i give them an idea like this i have to give them um all the technical feasibility points, like, you know, how we're going to do it, how many days you need. And then I need to give them the budget. I need to give them the crew. We need to practice with the rehearse and I have to give them the whole thing. So that's what, that's what I'm doing today. But back then, no, I was just following directions. That, that's really exciting that you're able to contribute. And actually, these ideas are probably best coming from you because you know what is possible with that helicopter. You know what you can do and what you can't do. So, you know, you know, it's limitations. So um, it's yes, really exciting. But there's, there is one thing that is complicated in my job is when I give an idea like that, I never land in a train on one skid at 40 miles an hour and drop five guys. So I'm, I'm, I'm giving those. <laughs> no, I think I can do it. So when I tell him that, I think I can do it. But I, you have to understand that conversation is eight months before we're going to actually do it. And it's not something I can practice on a Sunday morning. I need to find a rail track with no wires. I need to find a diesel locomotive so there's no wires. I need to find a stretch. You know, it's more complicated than he thinks, you know, than you think. So I mean, I'm still saying that because they told me, so for that, you know, extraction movie, they told me that, okay, Fred. So anyway, I, I proposed the idea and then for four months, I don't hear anything about it. 
And then um, four months later, they said, okay, Fred, so you have to send us a budget and blah, blah, blah. So we do the budget, but you have, you have to understand it's million of dollars. Find the train and find this and find that. And then, and then when I'm, I'm starting to do the rehearsal, now there's tremendous pressure. There's 300 people, it's going to be 10 days. Like I'm thinking, shit, you know, what, what was wrong with me to well, offer no, those did. kind of ideas? And <laughs> can, can that really be done? You know, in a sexy way, you can always land a helicopter on a train. I mean, for me, there's nothing complicated there. But to do it to a way you can film it, so it's going to look like, wow, you know, then it's not as simple as it is. And you have to do it 10 times because they have to. <laughs> so just quick story with that. So when I gave them the idea and they said, OK, what happened is that the, the, the tracks they found, there was only 22 seconds between trees. So you know, I never told them how long I need to do it, but at the end they said, you have 22 seconds to approach the train, land on the train, exit the guys and get out. So That's now tough. it was a little bit more complicated anyway, yeah. Well, actually, I'm really glad you mentioned um, the film Extraction that you've been shooting for because I wanted to show the viewers um, a video that you posted on your social media of the explosion. So you're passing the back of the train and there's an explosion. And one of your comments was that the explosion went off a bit too soon. So if we can show the video first. I mean, wow, that, that looked close. So one of your comments yeah. was that close call. So can you tell us about that? How did that happen? So... The landing on the train is one piece, but uh, in the story, there's three helicopters approaching the train, uh, attacking the train, and uh, this is at the beginning. So when we did the rehearsal of this, they're supposed to, we're supposed to shoot from the helicopter, we send a rocket to the back of the train, and then there's an explosion in the back of the train. Of course, we're not doing that for real, but they do put an explosion to pretend we shot it. So when we did the rehearsal of this, the guy pressing the switch for the explosion, um, I told him, you know, I'm going to give you a three, two, one action. On action, you push the, the thing, but you wait for me. Because I was, uh, in the, just to be precise, in the, in the story, the helicopter is going to crash into the back of the train. So I said, wait, you wait, you know, at least two, three seconds after I'm gone to press the switch. We don't, I mean, there was a something happened that day. So anyway, the guy pressed the switch when I was almost there. Luckily, I was on my way out and not on my way in towards the explosion. At least he didn't press the switch when I was on my way to the explosion. But I really, I mean, when he did it, um, I felt the heat of that explosion inside the machine. But you have to understand the doors were on. So, and, and but because, because there is no uh, debris, it's only flame and heat. Uh, even if, you know, the blade goes through the flame, it's like if you put your finger on a candle, it doesn't do anything. But the, the explosion was maybe 10 feet from me on the way out, but I felt like a gigantic hand pushing me, like a, like a, like a piece of uh, small thing. So it yeah. just, you don't have time to, uh, to be scared. No. But after, it's like, shoot, you know. And, you know, in the movie business, this should not happen because we rehearse, we put our effort, our time, the studio put the money, so it was it was just you know a little bit sketchy, but all went good, all, you know, no problem there. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I can't wait to see it, and I'm glad you survived it, so that's all good. <laughs> um, yeah, when you're going to see the movie, though, you're only going to see the explosion, and then because the, the helicopter will be gone because technically we crash in the back of the train. But we'll know you were there. We'll know. Um, yes, you would know. Another thing I was going to ask you, so, um, I mean, low level flying must be so normal for you. So when you're cruising at sort of a normal altitude, like 2000 feet, does it feel weird? Yeah, I, I mean, um, yeah, I'm not, you know, flying above, I would say 500 feet, that it gets boring to me. But I mean, I don't want to be arrogant saying that. It's just that I'm so used to fly low that it's just not interesting for me when I no. go over 500 feet. Now, I have to behave sometime and go to 1,000 or 1,500 because for regulation, but mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't really <laughs> like it. Um, oh, yeah. you, don't up there. you know, but the thing is with the low flying part is, I, to me, is 
no flying, you know, you have, you have to be so careful, but we only fly low on a place that we've been scouting, that we've yeah. been checking. You know, the problem is people look at social media and may think we just fly, you know, in a canyon. But we send, you know, a ground crew. I have a ground crew that works with me. They're fully certified pilots. Um, they're between 5,000 hours and 15,000 hours, the ground crew, just for you to, to give you an idea. So those guys are fully certified pilots, stunt pilots. They walk the run. They check wires. We note wires. Um, if that wires is hard to see, we put people with the orange and the fluorescent jacket at the bottom of each pole. Uh, so we see them. We put a spotter with the radio that can say, hey, Fred, 10 seconds, wire, 5 seconds, wire. So we go through a process. So that's not representing, you know, in movies, of course. But um, there's a lot into it because when we fly low in a canyon or a complicated sequence, I cannot have to think, like, I don't want to think, where's the wire? Where is this? Because then it takes the creative part away from you know, your mindset. I need to be dedicated at 100% to the shop we're filming and not to all the problems you can have, you know. Yeah, put them away and then you can focus on the shop. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, I mean, I've flown low level in a helicopter. I mean, no, nowhere near as often as you have, um, but I feel a massive rush of adrenaline when I do. You know, is this something that you still feel or are you so used to it now? Are you quite calm? No, I mean, for me, I'm used to it. I mean... Um, flying low level to me is not really difficult in, in a, as long as you know there's no wires, there's no obstacles, you know, then it's just a question um, to me, you know, the machine, I mean, I don't want to be arrogant saying that again, but to me, the machine, I'm the machine, okay, so uh, the blade tip and the aircraft, it's me, it's one person, I don't feel detached to the machine. So um, if I go to a, a small, a narrow place, I feel comfortable because it's like if I'm asking you to walk in a hallway, you're not thinking it's tight, you know. So you need to get to that point um, to be one with the machine to do, you know, pushing the envelope a little bit. But if, if you don't have, you haven't reached that level, then that once it's become more complicated and more, I would say, risky, you know. Yeah, so you need to be so comfortable with the machine that you fly in socks. <laughs> is this right that you fly in socks? <laughs> that is, okay. So that is true, but not all the time. Um, I only do it when, what happened is the, a lot of people on the pedals in the helicopter, in a plane is a little bit different, but in the helicopter, they put their feet on it, their shoes, and they use the whole foot to press on it. Uh, mm -hmm. The way I do it is my feet, it's my toe, toes. I don't do it with my foot. It's just the, the, my toes that press on it. So it's a very gentle. So usually with my shoes, it's not easy for me to do that. I need to put on a very light shoe. So if I do a stunt, that is something complicated, or I need to, to do like some crazy flying in a very tight environment, then I will remove my shoes to be even more one with the aircraft. And I'm telling a lot of pilots, try to fly without your shoes just once. And you're going to see how amazing feeling it is. Because if you think about it, you don't want to have anything between you and the machine. And usually you have a lot of stuff in between you and the machine. You have the seat first, that it's something. And then you have some people put gloves. I think it's a mistake, but I, uh, because you're losing, you're losing it's another something between you and the machine. You have the control of the aircraft, the hydraulic or whatever. That's another something between you and the machine. And then you have your shoes. Um, so if you, if you take off as much as you can, um, that's why you have to, you need comfortable shoes. You, I mean, to me, you have to be bare, barefoot. And, and then it's amazing. I mean, for me, it works fantastic. Yeah, I mean, I can relate slightly. During my training, I was wearing Timberland boots, which are really heavy in the helicopter. And when I transitioned to light trainers in the spring summer, I found I was I wasn't over overworking the pedals, you know, and it was much easier to control the aircraft with less input. So I completely understand what you're saying. I haven't tried socks, so I'll give that a go another day though. Um, so the next thing I want to ask you, um, you know, you've achieved so much. Is there anything left that you really want to do? Um, you know, is there anything, any goals, any challenges? 
you know, they, they, the, the directors and producers, they put challenge on me, you know, every, every time. Um, I just did a very complicated sequence for a movie called Beverly Hills Cops 4 um, that maybe you don't know because you were not born yet, you know, Sarah, but I'm sure there's a couple of guys there that may know. <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> in a good way, um, there was a, it's a very complicated sequence. I cannot, you know, elaborate too much because, uh, you know, we just finished the sequence, but it was a very challenging sequence and um, it was not easy for me to do um, because you have to understand, okay, when I do a stunt with the helicopter, it's not just about me, you know, my part, I can control. The problem is all the other stunt going on. So it could be cars close to me. It can be another aircraft. It can be a, the train. I don't control what the other do. So sometimes, you know, we can be, you know, sometimes I fly next to a car and I'm not kidding, the car is half a foot from me. So I can do what I can do, but the, if the guy hit me, what, what I'm going to do? So it's, it's challenging. So when I do those uh, sequence, I'm 1000% mm -hmm. focused on it. We all also do a lot of you know, preparation and everything, but the fact that I have to relay on other people for my life and for, you know, the safety of the, uh, of the sequence, it's challenging, you know, it's not an easy thing to do. No, that's a challenge in itself. You must have to have a lot of trust in your crew and your team around you. Yeah, you do, but I don't always choose the stunt guys. It's from the, the, the team. So I usually work always with the same people, but sometimes I don't. So it, it's, uh, it, it's the, the stuff they ask me to do in general, when I do the stunt itself, it's always a challenge to me. I have to, um, to be ready my my mental uh mind mindset like uh, i always say you know my job is my life it's a lifestyle because mm -hmm. i have to sleep well you know i don't drink alcohol i don't drink coffee i never drink alcohol in my life by the way um no, no coffee you know i sleep and and that stuff so I, i'm super careful the way i manage my life to be ready for those moments you know i exercise a lot and all these things so it's not just um and that's another thing you know i'm telling the young pilots out there Make sure that your job becomes your lifestyle because if you want to be very good, you, ha you can't just be good when you step into the aircraft. What's going to mm -hmm. happen before? If, if you were fighting with somebody or you have frustration or then it's going to be transpiring to the decision you're going to make. You know, I, I believe yeah. that you have to be ready for it. So, yeah. Yeah, it's a lot of mental preparation to make sure that you're in the zone and yeah. you're good for it. That's yeah. good. No, I completely understand that. Um, and uh, one thing I think that not many viewers will know, um, but I believe you hold the world record for flying a helicopter at altitude uh, in South Africa, right? Yeah, correct. I've done that in 2002. Um, I mean, it's the, that must feel like the, the crisis of uh, 40 years old, you know. Ah, uh, mid crisis. <laughs> yeah, mid, uh, mid life crisis. <laughs> That's slightly um, more extreme than flying a Porsche. You're right. Uh, you're right. But uh, the Porsche was not enough, even if I had <laughs> Porsche. But um, He's right. I mean, you know, it was a challenge. Um, but it was a team effort. It took two years uh, to set up. It was very difficult because nobody wanted to help me doing it. Uh, back then, you know, uh, I was special. Didn't want to help. Uh, Eurocopter didn't want to help. Uh, the French authorities didn't want to give me permission to go above the, v, the VFR uh, ceiling, you know, for VFR aircraft. They, everything was against me. I could not find the, the proper equipment for a counter pressure jacket for the line. It was, everything was complicated. So it took me two years, my own money. Um, mm. I got some of the money, but I, you know, anyway, so it, it, was a, it was a challenge. And again, same thing than before, I had the idea to do it. And mm -hmm. I remember the night, the morning, of doing it, I was thinking, what the heck? Like, why I put myself in those situation? Why, you know? But um, I, at the end, you know, I was, I was happy to do it. But there was some complicated, complicated things that happened on the way up. Um, and I had a nervous breakdown when I landed. It took me forty minutes um, when I landed, just before I touched down. By the way, uh, after doing all the crazy stuff. Um, my body started to shake. 
um, really like an uncontrolled way. And I'm talking about in the flare, like a few seconds before touching down, my mm -hmm. body started to shake. And when I landed, and then it took me 40 minutes, I was crying and emotionally distressed for 40 minutes. And before that happened, I, w I had no pity for people that had nervous breakdown. And I guarantee wow. you that after, after this, I have tremendous respect now for people that have nervous breakdown because I hit my threshold that day, you know. Mm. So that was and, interesting and it, for me because, yeah. Yeah, it's possible. Because I know you had a problem with your oxygen, didn't you, on the way up? There was a problem with the oxygen yeah. tube. It's, it, it's in, in fact, what happened, I had a guy that was in charge of all the safety um, features on it. And what happened is, my so my mom told me that for her to be comfortable for me to do this, she wanted me to wear a parachute. Even if we know a parachute won't do any good. But what happened is the guy that was in charge of safety, I was very stressed that morning. So I had people to help me basically to get ready. And my counter pressure jacket, which is basically a, 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 like a inflatable jacket with a, with a, a regulator and higher mm. you go, it put pressure to avoid, you know, the air in the lungs to expand. The problem is the guy in charge of my city put the parachute above that. So now you have the straps above that. So when I was on my way up, that counter pressure jacket was doing its job and it was inflating. But because of the strap, I couldn't breathe anymore. But the problem is I have my helmet and the, the respirator system. I could not look down and see what was going on. So what happened is I saw flashes when I was at 20,000 feet, something like that. I saw flashes like you're gonna pass out. But I did not understand because when you're sitting and you don't make an effort, you're not really uh, realizing you know, what's going on. So it was, yeah. it was tricky, so that's what happened. And I, I had, in fact, a few opportunities to stop. And that's mm -hmm. when the mindset, you know, the learning curve for me is what hap whatever happened to you um, in your life, to me, that world record was just uh, 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 telling me what to do in my life. So basically, you have so many opportunities to fail and you have so many opportunities to stop because you have problems. And it, it's for anything. Uh, it's not just for flying and aviation. But if you fight it hard, then you, you pass those humps or those difficulties. And I know it's a cliche to say that, but me, I experienced it. You know, when I had that problem, I could have stopped. You know, and I fought it and I resolved the issue, but it was, it was a scary moment. It was hard. I could, have, I could have died for sure, but I went through. And then there was other issues later, but that was one of them, you know. So to me, I learned a lot in that hour and a half, um, you know, event for sure. For yeah. me how, high did you, how high did you get? 42,500 feet. Wow. I bet your back was really happy to have you back down on the ground, you feel, isn't she? You feel very lonely, very lonely. Uh, I can tell you that. And the South African people, they're so passionate. They were so nice to me. There was that 747 from South African Airways. And I was on the same frequency than everybody else. And then I remember he said the, that 747 captain, he told the tower, you know, I don't understand. I can see a little point. There's like on my T cast, there's a little on my radar. I can see a little point, but it's not moving. And then the guy at the tower said, I oh, don't worry about it. It's a crazy French guy trying to break the world at its record. I can hear, you know, I say, hey guys, I can hear, you know. And then the 747 said, oh, that's awesome. Can I do a flyby? I said, no, it's 747. <laughs> um, you know, absolutely not. The guy didn't give a shit. He came. And he came so, I mean, you know, it's 747. I was going 35 knots, cruising speed. He was going, I don't know, 500, 400, I don't know, whatever. So anyway, he came so close for me. He was so scared. But they did that as to be nice and passionate. And, uh, you know, so there was, you know, there was some very good stuff that happened that day. Very, very quickly. How long did it take you to get to 42,000 feet? So it took me um, eight minutes to go to... 20,000, and then it took me another hour and um, 15 
to to do to get to forty two thousand five hundred. Um, the 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 forty. It took me forty five minutes to go from like thirty two thousand feet to for, to the for those ten thousand feet, and then it took me four minutes to descend, including. Yeah. Uh, because I, I, my engine shut down at 42,500, so I had to restart the engine at 14,000. But it was very scary because I did it in Cape Town, and I was above the ocean because there was maybe a 50 knots wind up there, and my, 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 my speed was 35 knots. So I was going backward, and I was going over the ocean. There was sharks and stuff. I, everything goes to your mind. Um, and anyway, I mean, it's a little bit long story to explain. I, I'm just finished to write a book, by the way, where I'm explaining everything in that book. Uh, the book is going to come in a few months. Not not just about the world record, about a lot of stuff, but I'm explaining everything that went through my mind. That now, it was it was a lot. I think the the breakdown that happened at the end at the end is because from that event, the, the four minutes of descent was extremely hard mentally because I was fighting for my life for so many things at the time. Um, so it, it was, and in fact, when you go through event like that, there is no room for breakdown. Like you have to manage because only you can make a difference between life and death. So to me, those four minutes were very hard, but I was able to manage one problem after another. And by doing that, and I think I, I, I hit my, my threshold like before that my body started to say I'm done. But mentally I was strong enough to hold it. And then when, when the body knew I was only a few seconds from the ground, he said that's it. You know, it was it, it was it was hard. You know, it was hard. Fred, I have one one question for you, which is um we, we've sadly we've overrun by about twenty minutes at the moment. Um, but when your book's out, will you come back and, and talk about your book and sure, and sell 1, some copies? Yeah, one thousand percent. Fantastic. I, Fantastic. It's it's a good a good point. When they sell the movie rights to your book, Fred, who are you going to ask to get to play you in the movie? <laughs> I don't know, but not. I don't know. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see if it goes so far. You know, the the the, the <laughs> book is just. To, sure. they, there's so many people asking, you know, how you get, you know, like from Africa to Hollywood, right? It's 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 those journey, um, and this is why it's very important, I think, for young pilots to understand that it's not about the end goal because the end goal, for me, it's defined by your journey. It, it you aim for something and the life takes you somewhere else. This is why you want to be very careful about the journey more than the end goal. Um, I, so anyway, um, I, in the book, I'm trying to explain, you know, a few things for all the young pilots out there that need guidance on what they should do and not do, um, you know, to, uh, to be, a, you know, happy and successful pilots. I think we'll definitely have to get you back to talk about that book when it's out. Yeah. Yeah. With pleasure. Brilliant. I think, sadly, we're going to have to wrap up because we have overrun by quite a lot. So um, I'm sure everyone else would join me in saying a massive thank you. I know the comments have been have been really, really positive um, and everyone's loved. Everyone could listen to it for hours and hours and hours. Um, so we, I think we need to get you back. When, when the book's out, we'd love to get you back. There you yeah, go. Hey, my talk. pleasure. No problem. Good to get you back again. Be, and, and, and we can always do uh, we can always do something else when the movie comes out and the, you know and if you know what I, <laughs> I did it we can always do it. no we can always do a little something to explain more because when the movie is out I can go into specific specifics on how we prep that sequence and that stuff. Mm -hmm. you know? uh, the the movie that you've just shot not the movie about your book. <laughs> no no uh, <laughs> yes correct correct. Fred, I have to ask Fred. Um, do you ever have like a bring bring your friend to work day because. I am volunteering here. <laughs> sure, um, I, I, I can do it. Um, the only way for me to do it is for you to be part of my crew because there is no guest allowed. But uh, it's possible if you if you if you can behave, and if you have um, common sense, then that's good. I have we common can. sense, composure, and a helicopter license. I mean, I'm there. <laughs> no, but I mean, passion and common sense, then we can do something. Yes. 
We can, we can vouch. We can vouch for Sarah. She's sensible. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, thank you very, very much, Chris. Absolutely tremendous. Absolutely brilliant. Um, I hope we have to we have to quickly move on to finish the rest of the show. So, again, thank you a thousand times, and we look forward to seeing you again really soon. When, maybe You're when welcome. the film comes out and when the book comes out. Yeah. So, one thousand times for any time. Thank you, Fred. Yes. Thank, thank you, you very Fred. much. Okay. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank, thank you, guys. It's that was painful. awesome. Yeah, how good is Fred at making air fix models? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, well, that, that, you know, I, I got the impression that Fred is good at everything. And just, you know, just super nice guy. Mm. I, I, I don't think I've ever, you know, we've had some amazing guests, but he's right up there, isn't he? Sure. Yeah. yeah. He is right up there. He is right up there. Right. Uh, we're, we're five minutes over, so we better have a slightly let's, let's, speedy... Let's, yeah, let's fancy breeze hangar. through Fancy Hangar really fast. Um, so uh, we obviously inspired, well, not inspired by the news, but following the sad news of Frank Robinson's death, uh, Frank was a game changer with uh, with his R-22 helicopter, and that got us thinking what aeroplanes, what game-changing aeroplanes uh, would we pick for our Fancy Hangar? <laughs> Who's first? <laughs> Cut to the Cut to the You've already won. won. I think Johnny Come might. On, Ed. Yeah. <laughs> you can go first, Ed. In that oh, case, I'll because we're cutting to um, Edwin. So I, I, I picked this, the beautiful Bonanza Beach, uh, Beechcraft Model Thirty Five Bonanza. Um, so you've got to remember that at the end of World War Two, um, light aircraft were pretty much all very samey. Um, there were two came out at the same time: the Cessna One Nine Five, which was a radial high wing, you know, quite like many aeroplanes before, and Beechcraft unveiled this, the stunning Bonanza, um, and it was. It featured an easy to manage, horizontally opposed six cylinder engine, retractable gear. Um, it was beautiful, it was fast, low wing, all aluminium. Um, it was just, um, it was a real breath of fresh air. And uh, 75 years later, that aeroplane is still in production. It's the longest continuous mm -hmm. aeroplane in production. Uh, and I just think one of those for my fancy hangar is just a fabulous little aeroplane. Johnny. Cool. Right. I have gone for yes. this little thing. So it's not actually, obviously, this is the RV3, um, and the RV1 did exist. It was a derivative of the Stitz Playboy, um, but the RV1 was never sold, and the RV3 was the first one to go on sale, and it just kicked off a whole, well, a 10,000, there's Ed, mod modelling that exact spat. Um, yeah, it kicked off, what, 10,000? Amazing aeroplanes oh, built throughout the world. Yeah, 11,333, I think, that when I looked this morning. So, got out then. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think it just kicked off um, a, a crazy world of home building and, and opened up a lot of doors in terms of performance and, well, total performance, getting in and out of strips, going fast, doing aerobatics, all that kind of thing. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. I'm going to jump in. I'm going to jump in now. I've I've, I've gone for this. Just this is the Lockheed Jetstar. Um, what? I should have gone for it because it <laughs> the Lockheed Jetstar. <laughs> Lockheed Jetstar, four engine, a four engine business jet built by Lockheed, the one and only uh, business jet, business jet they actually built, created a whole new category. I know you could argue there was a whole bunch of piston type stuff before, but the real reason I've picked the Lockheed Jetstar, the real reason is because it was used by. Kelly Johnson, the Vice President of Special Projects at Lockheed, has used transportation. And frankly, Kelly Johnson has to be probably the most accomplished person in the world of aviation ever and will mm. probably never be surpassed. I mean, the guy had a hand in the P-38 Lightning, of which over 10,000 was built, plus the SR-71, plus the 114 Nighthawk, plus the U-2, plus the 104 staff i mean the guy had a hand in so much that having that airplane in my fancy hangar just gives us the opportunity to talk about kelly johnson and everything is yes of course it's general aviation general aviation involves business jets doesn't it general aviation is everything that's not military aviation and not commercial airline it is and frankly i would stretch that for kelly johnson he what, what an absolute superstar and what a brilliant airplane four four jet engines two big fuel tanks it might have been a bit thirsty you know but but 
just a reason. To, yeah, I know, I know. Yeah, but I mean, huge achievements. I mean, I'm I'm thinking of turning my I'm thinking of turfing everything out of my fantasy hangar completely, having a fire sale and just not literally a fire sale and just <laughs> making it into the Kelly Johnson Memorial hangar because this one of everything that he had a hand in. Would just be astonishingly good as a hang. So there you go. That's me. Marcus Clark asks, where are the helicopters? Well, I think Sarah might be your woman. Dun, dun, dun. I'm, I'm staying with the helicopter theme tonight. Um, and also, in honour of Frank Robinson's passing, I've chosen the R-22 as my game-changing aircraft in GA history. So, uh, you know, it's two-seater, two-bladed, um, light utility helicopter produced since 1979 and it's become one of the world's top selling civilian helicopter with over 4,000 sold worldwide to date. Um, it's reliable, it's very economical and it's become one of the most popular training helicopters so it's it's equivalent in the fixed wing world is like the 152 really um, and they say that if you can fly an R22 you can fly anything so that's mine. Very good. Okay. There you go. So, what, what are the comments saying then? Well, Colin Wilkinson says Johnny wins. Um, uh, uh, Martin says enough, Ian. Um, <laughs> Ian wins. <laughs> uh, what have we got? Ian wins. End of. Elvis had some of those. Um, what else have we got? Ed bribed Johnny to choose that one. I I, I picked an up <laughs> my fancy hanger a long time ago. It just happened Johnny picked my other RV3. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, explains why Ed thinks Johnny wins. Well, you've got to say, uh, I still like my bonanza. Um, uh, Dave wins. Dave's not here. <laughs> Ed, <laughs> uh, yeah, and that's kind of it. Tom Watson makes a good suggestion. PA28 has got to has, has to have made the biggest impact on GA. Probably the 172 as well, I would think, maybe. Mm. Um, yeah. Dan Smith said, yeah. anything by like Bert Rutan. Uh, Nigel Hitman says, J3 Cab. I've already got one of those in my fancy hanger, too. Um, yes. So, uh, yeah. So, um, yeah. yeah. I'm going to declare that I've won that one. Uh, yes. Because, it does look like you might. Yeah, as hard as it is to say. Oh, no. Johnny, Johnny, Johnny. Johnny wins. Uh, Johnny wins. I think it's a very quickly snatched back by Johnny. So, um, <laughs> well, look at this. I didn't notice yeah, Dave was missing. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, oh, if Dave. Was here, I would have won that. Everyone would have been Sarah, Sarah, Sarah. But he's not here anymore. Everyone's forgotten about helicopters now. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I think. Well. Yeah. If um, if if Fred had a casting vote. Yeah. yeah. Like, if he's like, what is this star nonsense? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Okay. Oh, well, we're, we're, let's just say that all of those have made a significant contribution to general aviation. Absolutely. Should we, yeah. Should, yeah. Should we go for the participation medal this week? Yes. All around. Yeah. A joint slap on the back. So, um, just like and a, as, at junior school. I've got to say, as guests go, Sarah needs a pat on the back because uh, mm -hmm. Fred North was uh, was Sarah's achievement. So, uh, yeah. fantastic work yeah. there. He's yeah, great guest. Great guest. Mm. Yeah. Well done, Sarah. Great guest. Very good. Yeah. Very, very good. Jane says, I vote, oh, Sarah. This fancy hanger. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Good stuff. Yeah. Good. Well done on the guest. Not too sure about the 22, but there you go. Ah. <laughs> very good. Right. Uh, right. Okay. right. Um, Have we got much in the way of events, Johnny? Yeah, I'll just run through them quickly. Historic Aircraft Association Symposium at Hendon on the 19th. Uh, night shoot aviation photography workshop at Hendon on the 19th. Um, Heathrow Aircraft Enthusiast Fair at Kempton on the 20th. And the Flight Help Winter Ball in Cheltenham on Friday, 2nd of December. And the Airability Ball is on next week. I think it's next week, a week on Saturday. Um, and we'll get, between now and then, we'll get the uh, link to their live auction. And so please go online and buy some good stuff there. Um, are they giving, are they, is one of the items the um, uh, a spot on the live stream? It should be. It should be. I believe it is. I'm, I just need to verify that. Uh, fantastic. But yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Good. Brilliant. Well, Thank you very much, everybody. It, it did overrun by, in the end, uh, nearly 15 minutes, but the Fred North was absolutely worth every single minute of that. And we could have gone on talking for hours and hours and hours. Mm. 
So yes. uh, I'd like to say thank you, thank you, Fred. Thank you, team. Thank you, Ed, with his slightly strange hat. You look yeah. a little bit like a kind of like a, an aluminium Ku Klux Klan hat going on there, Ed. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's not a good connotation. <laughs> that's not. That's the, I, th- I, th- I think the Ginola one is is got to be so much better. Um, it's, it's anyway, be better. I'm not going to play that again. No, no, uh, no. Yeah. So and thank you very much, week. everybody. And we'll tune in thank next you. week. We'll see you next week. <laughs> thank you very much. Have a good one. Bye. Bye, safe everyone.